It's great to be here again with Justin Wells, who, as many of you know, is a, a documentarian and also an adjunct professor teaching documentary at Biola University. And he is um, working in feature films as well as a cameraman. And he is also making a documentary of this little corner. So we have a lot of, uh, lot of things that we can talk about today. Um, I think you've been on already since Chino one time, haven't you? Yeah, I've been on your channel since Chino. Yeah, yeah. Or is this the first time since no, Chino? This is the first time since Chino. Okay, yeah. okay. So Justin and I had many opportunities to talk while we were at Chino. And uh, I just felt like I wanted to pick his brain every minute of the day because he sees symbolism in so many of the same ways that I do. And uh, it was just really exciting to meet in person. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. There's something about meeting people in person that it creates this sort of lively atmosphere in between the two persons that, that I've never really noticed before. When I, when I have normal interactions with people, <clears throat> I don't notice it. But because I had met all these people online and then met them in person, I could sense this energy that's actually in the air between people. And it was really exciting. So so what we want to talk about, first of all, you, you I guess you just you just dropped a bombshell on Paul Vanderclay's channel. And uh, this will publish quite a bit after Paul's video. But why don't you tell us about the bombshell that you dropped on Paul's video? Well, I didn't mean for it to be a bombshell, but I um, so so when we when we were at the Chino conference prior to the Chino conference, John Van Donk, who you know, said, you know, why don't you make a video, like a 10 minute video that would be an introduction for what an estuary is, you know, this, this is, you know, for somebody that you have friends and, or family that say, what is this group that you go to twice a week? You know, is it AA? Is it Alcoholics Anonymous? Is it a therapy group? What is it, you know? And, um, so I said, yeah, I think I could make a little 10 minute video, use some of the footage from the conference. Uh, we filmed an estuary group in progress, having a conversation um, and a little bit of editing um, interview material. And I could make a nice little, you know, something that John could put on the website for the estuary hub. Um, so I, I last week, I just sort of dove into the editing and I started putting things together. And um, I started uh, getting help from people via Twitter. You know, I just put a little thing out on Twitter. Hey, if there's anything from this corner of the internet that you find compelling, you know, shoot me a shoot me a message. And so I started putting stuff together, and and I I kind of went into to my my cave, my editing cave, and I just kept going. And finally, when I kind of came to, I had 45 minutes of very watchable footage on my <laughs> on my editing timeline. Um, that consisted of um, some audio that I had gathered at the conference um, and then found footage from different videos like your channel or somebody else's channel, Paul's channel, um, lecture videos, and just kind of put it all together. In and I, and I sat back and I watched it. I watched 45 minutes of it. And I said, you know, I think that this actually could work for someone who doesn't, who's not familiar with this little corner of the internet not necessarily familiar with the lingo, with the super high level conversations, but it would serve as kind of something that's entertaining, interesting, um, mostly kind of a documentation of the, of the, of this one sort of pattern of rumination that I keep seeing over and over, which is meaning crisis, a sense of not belonging, and then looking for some kind of going on some kind of a quest for a solution to that problem. Um, and I think that it, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to think that this is a, um, this is the perhaps private thoughts of an entire generation, you know, or at least a, you know, a problem a, or, uh, maybe not even conscious, you know, kind of sense of not knowing how you fit into, uh, the world in this larger sense. And, um, Paul Vanderclay in particular has had countless conversations with randos, <laughs> you know, individual people that are expressing this same kind of thing. So I just started putting them all together, 
You know, I just like this part of the conversation and a bunch of people different saying that. And then this part of it and a bunch of people saying, um, and, and I think, I think it'll work. And, and there's a certain point whenever I'm kind of working on something where I, I kind of reach a point where I say, okay, yeah, I think this is going to work. And I reached that point over the weekend. So I figured I'll, I'll go ahead and go public with, <laughs> and let people know, let people in the, in this little corner of the internet know that with their permission and with their help, I'd like to take that story and package it in a, in a, in a nice, you know, 80 minute, 90 minute um, film. Well, so how, how do you describe even what is meant by this little corner of the internet? Now, I don't mean what it's all about, but I mean, um, just using that phrase indicates a certain what would you say, ecology of channels or something? Um, a sort of matrix of talking heads or... <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, I don't know. How do you describe what, what is meant by this little corner? Well, it's that's it's some, something is happening that's interesting with regard to, to, to whatever it is. It, it's some kind of phenomenon, I think. Some kind of a social phenomenon, maybe. Um, that is a combination of the technology of, you know, YouTube, um, the ability to have these conversations over Zoom or whatever, and the specific ideas that people are processing through. And so um, what I have, you know, on my little timeline is are people reflecting on the the coining of the term by Sevilla and you know, the, and, and different, it, you, I even have a clip of you talking to Grim Grizz where you're, you're saying, you know, don't you worry that it, this, this little corner of the internet is not embodied. It's all virtual. It's like a video game, you know, <laughs> um, all, all kinds of different things uh, that people are saying and questioning about it. And so that's, I don't want to answer that question. I just want to sh show people ruminating on it, you know, because it's cause like, you know, like what Grim Grizz said to me at, at the conference, he said, well, you know, something's happening here. Um, and, but I'm not sure what, you know, and that's kind of what I think too. Something interesting is going on. And I'm the type of person that likes to, to just look at it and put it up and say, okay, let's all think about this together. That's what I think a documentary film is. It's a chance for us all to focus our attention for a period of time, an hour, an hour and 20 minutes or something together and all kind of think about this phenomenon together. Well, I like the term that Graham Grizz came up with. Uh, he calls this a flotilla of channels because <laughs> it does kind of seem that way. All these little channels are kind of connected together loosely. And, and to some extent, we follow each other a little bit, but you know, there's so much content now that everybody can't follow everybody. So, and I do think that each channel has its own audience. I think that my audience is loosely connected to the corner, but also my audience has a particular flavor that that is probably different than most of the other channels. Um, although there are some times that it overlaps because of what, what we're talking about, but it is like a little flotilla. Or the other picture that probably works well, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the modern Battle, Battlestar Galactica which the is modern this, well i mean not not the old battle star galactica from 1980 but the one that was made five or ten years ago is that it, the one with edward james almost yes uh-huh yeah yeah uh -huh. and and so there's sort of this little flotilla of ships that are up there in space after earth implodes and then they have to kind of connect together and go from place to place to try to figure out how to survive yeah yeah kind of like that <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe one of the reasons why, see, because I've been thinking about just, you know, in the 90s, at least everyone watched Seinfeld all at the same time, every Thursday night. And that was a shared, a shared, um, you know, I don't know, mental space or a shared narrative or a shared, even you could say quasi mythology that people all followed together. And that would cause a common, uh, you know, point of conversation. You know, it was the water cooler right. phenomenon, right? Somebody had talked. It, to exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in the absence of that, 
you know, in it, today where it's like, oh, well, I'm halfway through this series on Netflix. Where are you? Oh, I'm just starting. Don't tell me about it. You know, um, in the absence of that, we notice that it's missing. And that's probably why at the conference um, in Chino, everybody was so excited to see each other because everyone, you know, they had a, a, an overlapping, you know, set of narratives and, you know, topics and, uh, you know, uh, Internet figures to 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 relate over you know and and that causes a lot of that's what i think human culture should have some kind of a shared mythology some kind of a story to live inside and since we don't have that um we're reduced to just small talk you know, mm -hmm. out there in the world and so this is something deeper than small talk which is a very a quintessentially human thing to to want and to have well, and the beautiful thing about it is you don't have to have watched every series of episodes that everyone else has watched in order to have that shared narrative, because in this ecology or this flotilla or whatever it is, there are enough shared symbolic underpinnings and um, intersections of ideas. So even if you're following one particular figure, like say, let's say you follow John Pervakey religiously, and then <clears throat> other people might be just following Paul, or they might be following Grim Grizz, but there's enough overlap of ideas that you can still have conversations, which is a little bit more like maybe um, what used to be the beauty of the academic environment, because people weren't all taking exactly the same class, but they still had depth of topics to talk about with each other because they were all learning and growing together. That is exactly what I said to Grimm was hmm. the only other time I had a similar feeling was when I was on the college campus and we were all taking the same classes, mm -hmm. you know, because then we had that. Yes, exactly. We would go out to dinner or we'd go out to the cafe after the class, you know, and, and we would have, you know, I, I was going to UCLA extension at night taking philosophy classes when I was like maybe 24 years old, just starting working at Panavision here in the Valley. And I would drive down to UCLA extension to take these classes. Cause I was so needed. I'm one of these people that just needs intellectual, you know, stimulation into intellectual conversation. And um, there were a bunch of retired guys that were taking these, you know, philosophy, of religion, existentialism, mythology, um, you know, Kierkegaard, uh, we did a class on Sartre, you know, I just was became addicted to these little um, night classes at UCLA, because it was the same group of people that took the classes, you know, a bunch of, there was a retired English um, teacher, and there was, you know, and I, so I was the one young guy with a whole bunch of retired guys, and we'd go to the cafe on campus there, and, and have conversations that are that the conversations in this world are very reminiscent of that for me. So I understand you have a little piece of the, the uh, documentary queued up that you can show us, give us sort of a flavor um, of what you're doing. Uh, yeah, here, let me share my screen. I don't want to give away too much yet, <laughs> but uh, uh, just so, you know, uh, oh, let me get rid of this. So, um, in, in case you're kind of wondering sort of how how this all works, um, this is my timeline here. And as you can see, you know, it's it actually goes on for about uh, five hours. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's in the process of kind of whittling it down. What I thought I'd do is I would just show the very, very beginning. Let's see. And, I, and I would should... give a class on editing because I would love to learn how to put together a oh, timeline like that and then chop it down into pieces. <clears throat> I, I'm I'm self-taught on editing. I, I'm, I'm sure if there's professional editors out there, they're going to look at my how I organize this and they're going to say, you know, that's not that's not right, you know. But <laughs> um, but this it's I have my own process. <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd show um, at the beginning of what will be. And I'm going to probably replace some of these shots, some of the establishing shots, you know, um, but uh, a general sense of what would be the the introduction to the estuary video um, using the the conference footage, um, just to kind of see kind of what I'm what I'm kind of throwing together and and what the tone of it will be. So let we'll watch like maybe a, a minute of it. Let me know if you can hear it. 
Yes. <clears throat> So I want to welcome you all to this event and uh, so another thing that I would like to do is to find out who is from where and um, who, who came the farthest. Um, I really appreciate this, this is uh, my little corner, you know, I got my, uh, my pastor here, my, uh, my professor, and now my guru. Oh boy. <laughs> Estuary is a thing that uh, kind of grabs you, it takes you over, and then you end up meeting new people, and you are uh, engrossed in conversation, and, and time flies when you do that. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask... Do you have any dating advice for young men? Oh man, I feel so sorry for everybody uh, that's young, that's younger than me. So we're gonna kick off the morning with Jonathan Peugeot, John Ravakey, having a dialogue, hopefully leading to the logos. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> You see, we're from Canada. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so that's just that's just a little a little taste of, of of some of what I'm working on. That's not finished by any means, but um, you know, I'm just starting to starting to put it put put it together. Well, it's so interesting the way you uh, which clips you choose to to emphasize to put together. I mean, I guess. I would not make a good documentary filmmaker because I tend to think so linearly, I guess, um, or chronologically. But it really is very interesting the way you kind of pick a little piece from here that was happening later and throw it into the, the beginning. And, you know, um, well, it, it doesn't I mean, have the it doesn't feel chopped up, even though it is kind of chopped up. Well, that's all this, I mean, that's just designed to raise a question, which I will then answer later. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole point of that section would be what is what does that guy mean my guru you know and then the other you know what's Derek talking about dating advice you know like just kind of like give you a little taste of going well what's going on here uh -huh. because if I raise that question then you'll keep watching because you want to know the answer to it you know that's that's the general idea yeah that's I think I've mentioned this before that Hans Zimmer who writes all these beautiful um compositions for movies like interstellar he said the way he always starts is by posing a question so some little musical phrase will go up ask a little question and then the next phrase answers that question and then another little question and that's jordan peterson's thing too that once you have a question then you have a reason to you know go after it so yeah that's really cool and so your yeah, process my, is then you, you take big chunks of stuff and line it up along your timeline and then you just start trimming away. Is it sort of like Michelangelo when he carves away everything that isn't? Well, David, or? Probably, well yes. The, the, the way I should do it is I should do it with multiple timelines probably and then have each scene kind of – you start with something longer, like let's say an interview – and then you go, okay, here's the main parts of it. You get it, what I do is I get it on the timeline and then I start going through and and removing the the material that's kind of like extraneous, you know, to try to get it down. Um, and and the, sometimes the problem is, is that the way people say it in such a way that you, you can't chop it up without it. You know, if you, oh. they won't pause and so, you know, you you have to put a longer phrase in there or something like that. And so sometimes what you'll do is you'll say, oh, shoot, like, I don't want to have them go off on this tangent. So I need to cut out of it. But um, I don't have him saying the beginning part of that for me to cut into that, to cut out that tangent, because the, the beginning part's intermixed within the tangent or something, the part that I want to cut out. So I might just use somebody else saying that you know, and cut it in or whatever, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. I, I find that editing is just all problem solving. Mm -hmm. You're just constantly problem solving. And can I put some B-roll here? Can I put a little music? Can I put this? Can I put that? Um, 
I generally start with a mu with a musical choice. Um, I, I have all of these these uh, musical archive um, musical archives that I have access to now. They have huge musical libraries that you can subscribe to, and you can get unlimited access, you know, rights to the to that music. Oh wow, that's great! Um, and I start with that on on um, on documentary. I'll start with the music because then it gives me kind of a sense of the mood I'm going for. Um, whereas it, with a narrative film, I might not, because I, I might think I'm going to give this to a composer later, so I'm not going to put any music on it yet. Let them, let that person come up with the music. But on documentary, I find that it's a little bit better to just go ahead and pick the music first, you know. Yeah, so there's a couple things there that are very consonant with with painting. And the first one, when you said you're always solving problems. That was the biggest surprise to me when I started trying to paint seriously. I mean, when I first started painting, I was taking a little class at the extension <laughs> education. You know, one of the high schools had a big room and they would bring in some lady to teach watercolor and a bunch of us would come in at night and take this class. But when I really started trying to, my, my first attempts were just reproducing what I saw in a photograph. There's so many problems to solve when you do that because, you know, there might be shadows in the photograph and you can't quite tell what's in the shadow. And is it important that what's in the shadow gets into the painting or is it not important? Or, you know, what about that wire that's running across there? Should I leave that in to add character or do I take that out in order to make it more, you know, prettier? Or, and, and you just, you're answering so many questions in your head while you're working. And it was really surprising to me because I thought it would just be straightforward. You get the paint, you reproduce what you're seeing in front of you. And it doesn't work like that at all. And then the second thing that you said is about how you pick the music so that it gives you a mood to work from. And that was one of the first things I learned from the creativity teacher is, and I mentioned this the other day, we have a big... Uh, journal that we carry around with us everywhere. And on every 20th page, we were supposed to write as big as we could, what mood do I want? So we would never forget that that's the first thing you have to think about before you start working. Because the mood determines the color, the, you know, what constraints you're going to put on it, um, the value structure, all of that is contained in that idea of the mood. And that's what music does too, because Music provides you the rhythm and it provides you the tonality, you know, how much, <clears throat> how much contrast is there in the music and whether it's peaceful or frenetic or whatever, you know, so I yeah, like I, the piece you had on your little clip. Oh, oh good. <laughs> um, I, f I have to actually tone the musical score down most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um because a musical piece that's written as a musical piece that are on these stock footage or these musical libraries are often too big because they're building because mm -hmm. the focus is supposed to be on the music. And so I use only um, uh, stock music sites that have what they call stems, which is four layers of it. You'll have strings, drums and bass, vo uh, maybe melody and then instruments. Um, and so I can take away three out of the four or sometimes two out of the four. Oftentimes I'm taking out the melody mm -hmm. uh, because that's going to distract. And so I can basically have come a little bit more of a bedrock of a, of a score that just kind of stays in one place. It doesn't build. Um, and then I can therefore direct the attention to the visuals instead of to the music. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I, that's that I've I learned uh, um, the hard way working for a boxing channel doing little boxing documentaries um, how to how to work with the music in such a way as to not have it distract you know or not overpower you know the what people are saying what the visuals are. I wish you could do workshops for some of the worship leaders at the churches. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I, I mean. Over the years, they've more and more gotten into this thing where once the pastor gets close to the end of his message, the musicians go back up there and start playing underneath the end of the message. And I'm like, yeah. and they're always playing something that makes you think about whatever song it is that you know they're going to start in with. And so your mind gets completely distracted. Or when the pastor says, okay, now it's time to pray. And then the musicians start playing something underneath the prayer. And it's like, I can't 
prey in this environment. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, really... it's, it's a delicate balance. I like to use subtle music in certain situations when you've been watching for a little while. You know, let's say you've been watching for 20 minutes and you've been hearing people talk and your cognitive side of your brain is kind of processing the information. But mm -hmm. then when I want you to, mo to shift your focus maybe to the emotional content, I'll just bring in a little bit of music, but it, it has to be very subtle because mm -hmm. it just causes you to clue you in. Hey, you should now be thinking about what this means. Maybe, you know, mm -hmm. like we've been mm -hmm. listening to these people for a while. Now here, this is what I think me, I'm telling, cluing you in as the filmmaker, you, the audience member. This is what I think is important. Now, you know, you should really, really pay attention to this part, you know, um, and that's something that you can do only in retrospect. It's I don't think you can necessarily do it live, you know, like that might be the problem that you're talking talking about in the church setting is um, it's not building something to something preconceived as here's the most important part of the message. It's just the end of the message. You know, but I bet you, you could retrospectively go back and say, okay, I'm going to clip out what I think is the most important. And now I'm going to layer in a little bit of music when I think you need to pay attention. Um, well, I, agree. I don't know. I, I think the layering in of music is a beautiful idea to, to engage that imaginative side. But I like, I was saying, I like what you were saying that it should be something that doesn't have an obvious melody in it that's going somewhere or an obvious trajectory right. that's going somewhere because then as as listeners we naturally get engaged with that and then we're, mm -hmm. we want we want to know where the music is going to go and then we've lost the thread entirely so yeah. i remember in the old days i i used to be a worship leader a long time ago and when i would go to worship conferences they would sometimes teach you something simple like a, a c suspended chord which is just a simple chord that, that they used to call it the angel chord <laughs> Because when they play a C suspended chord, it does give you this sense of you're just sort of, you're in a sort of suspended animation and you're not really expecting it to resolve. You can just stay there in this suspended state for a while. And so I think that kind of music is fine. You know, use a few suspended chords that don't, you're not expecting it to lead somewhere. Um, except when, of course, when you're doing the real worship music, then I've, I'd, I'd like it to be something that I can follow along with, which I have a harder time. The, <laughs> the more modern the music becomes, I have a harder time following it. But and that's just my problem. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it's just a matter of anything. It's it's the the attention. Like if it's if it's supposed to fo help focus your attention on to something else, then it shouldn't be calling attention to itself. You know, so yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. So it's very exciting that you're working on this. And, and so it, it sounds like you said you're going to do, you're thinking about doing a full length feature one, but you're also doing a 10 minute short form for the purpose of. Yeah. That's just for John Van Donk to do whatever he wants to do with it. <laughs> um, you know, Can I tell you uh, what his intention was. <laughs> yeah. Just basically um, so that anybody who's starting an estuary group, let's say you're an estuary group leader and you put up a, a, something on meetup.com or you, you know, kind of want to tell people what this is about, you can share that little video. Um, right now, I think um, he has on the website, he's got a Zoom uh, video up, which is people practicing the estuary protocol that he has. Um, so this would be just a, a, a more, a better version of that, you know, basically, um, what an estuary is kind of a little s snippets of some, some conversations, uh, from the estuary that we filmed at the Chino conference and, um, just kind of, hopefully I can make it, um, accessible to the lay person so that if someone says, oh, okay, that's what that little group is about, you know, it's about these conversations and, and it's about, uh, a certain way of doing conversation, you know, that it, that's more listening to understand rather than listen to argue. It's a little bit of a different game than what the, what the 24 hour news cycle is playing out there in the culture. Um, that's, that's all I would want it to be. It's just a little example of that. And then people can use it if they want to, to share it with their friends, if they want to say, Oh, here's kind of what an estuary is. This is kind of what this is about. That's all it would be. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So it seems like you'd want some way to differentiate it from, um, well, we were talking before we came, before we turned on the recording, we were talking about what would be the appropriate venue for showing a documentary like your, like your full feature documentary. And when you said that, what came, started running through my mind is all the very positive things that are happening recently with other people starting groups or organizations that are dedicated to overcoming the meaning crisis. They may not be calling it the meaning crisis. Um, just this morning, I was watching a, a talk that Jonathan Peugeot did for the Scala Foundation a year ago. And the Scala Foundation is an organization that was started by a woman who's a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. And she started the foundation for the purpose of renewing people's interest in the humanities to try to overcome the meaning crisis. She didn't use the word meaning crisis, but to try to bring people to a place again where they can find some meaning and some hope and some beauty in their world. And so I thought there are little things like that happening everywhere now that I've noticed in the last three or four years, these little sparks rising up. Another one though, that is more on the the political side to try to overcome political polarization is braver angels. And there are a couple of organizations like that. I can't remember the names of all of them, but they have this yeah. perspective of Crossing having party lines. Hmm? Crossing party lines. Oh yes. One of, well, that's yes. the one I, I used to, to volunteer for them. I, I was a moderator for them for a while. Yeah. So, you, so, you know, the, the drift was to get people to be able to talk about things, even that they disagree strongly over and still find um, common humanity. And, um, but, but that's the interesting thing about our little corners, very seldom are political issues even broached because people are thinking about the, another layer that's down underneath all that political stuff, right? Yeah, my personal journey was to, um, I think in 2020, it was in 2020, uh, during the pandemic, when there wasn't a lot of work, um, I wasn't working. Um, I was researching those organizations. There was Braver Angels, Crossing Party Lines, um, Building Bridgers, uh, you know, a bunch of different ones that cropped up. And they were all for that purpose of mm -hmm. they were worried about the growing polarization and they wanted to, to basically teach communication skills. Braver Angels was uh, founded by a marriage and family therapist using the um, techniques of, uh, you know, conflict um, uh, counseling, you know, counseling couples um, when they have conflicts um, using those same techniques, but for what they call reds and blues, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they'd have all these different techniques. And I, I went to some of their events and, you know, they would, they would have these exercises that they would do. And then I, I did went through the whole moderation training for um, crossing party lines and we would do these events all over Zoom because it was during the pandemic and we'd have just a whole bunch of people and um, we would um, run these sort of exercises of, of, you know, basically modeling how to listen to understand how to ask a question because you genuinely have a question, not because you're trying to do a gotcha question, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I wound up kind of finding out or, or about myself was that I was actually what is interested of what's upstream of politics. You know, so if you say politics is downstream of culture, what's upstream of culture? <laughs> and I, I put that on Twitter. I, I said on Twitter, uh, if politics is downstream of culture, what's upstream? And then Matthew Peugeot, of all people, answered me and he said, wizards. <laughs> <laughs> wizards are upstream of culture. And um, yeah, so I feel like my personal journey has been going upstream because I realized that all of these political debates have a frame, you know, and they're framed in terms of, for example, wedge issues, you know, and they're, and, and they're also, um, they're also framed by the 24 hour news cycle in terms of things that will, will, um, will garner attention and the easiest way to get attention is to push the outrage button because that activates the limbic system and the limbic system is the part of the brain that is the triggers the fight or flight um uh fight or flight instinct 
And so that's what happens when you hear a, a, a view that you strongly disagree with is that fight or flight thing will come in physiologically, it mm -hmm. will move you to action. And that's why you'll find that you have people on Twitter that have thousands and thousands of followers is because they keep pressing that button, which is the, you know, the, the lower brain function button to cause people to either love or hate them, you know, um, and, and so I realized, hmm, I'm not sure if that's the most healthy game to play mm -hmm. because look at the motivation for uh, people that are doing it. If you can monetize attention and the 24 hour news cycle and the, um, the Twitter sphere and the, the social media monetization, um, you know, techniques and all that, they've discovered that activating the limbic system is the, is the easiest way to do it do they really have your best interest in mind yours and my best interest in mind when they're writing these articles and doing these news stories and tweeting these tweets and doing all that stuff are they really concerned with human flourishing and the common good and and that sort of thing or are they just using this mechanism for um the purposes of this monetization technique so i think that the conversations going on in this little corner are upstream of that it, they are saying, um, you know, I, I mean, it's it's absolutely clear that, that someone like Paul or someone like Jonathan um, or John Verveke, you know, yourself, Sevilla, um, you know, all of these different people are have a genuine question that they want to answer an answer to and genuine ideas that they want to explore. And they're not concerned with this other game that I think is maybe gotten a, li a little maladaptive, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I find it, 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 as much as I enjoyed moderating these crossing party lines events, it was exhausting, mm -hmm. you know? And I felt like we were locked into that box of just the political conversations. And mm -hmm. whereas maybe I wanted to go outside of the box and talk about philosophy or talk about religion or talk about theology, and talk about aesthetics or whatever, you know? Yeah, there's there's so much good there. <laughs> wow. Um, so one of the things that that I noticed about the comments of uh, viewers, one of the most common comments that I get from somebody who's just stumbled onto my channel is, these conversations are so refreshing because they've been out in the rest of the internet, right? <laughs> where sometimes you listen to something and you might be very engaged by it, but it's exhausting because it's ramping you from one side to the other of your limbic system on the, the whole way through the conversation. And you get to the end of it and you're just, you know, you want to go take a nap or something. But, um, and the other funny thing that happened very early on with my channel was I had had a couple of conversations from the very beginning with a guy who, who was a geologist and who had done quite a lot of work in geophysics and he contacted me when I was on Paul's and Paul suggested that I should start a channel. So this geologist contacted me and he said, I, I'll be your first guest. He said, you want to talk to me? So, And he was very, very interesting to talk to because the two of us didn't have any contact points really. And we were both talking a little bit outside our own frame because he was trying to talk about quantum physics, even though that's not his field. And I was trying to engage with him on that level and I didn't know anything. And uh, Michael, who later became a frequent contributor to my channel, he made a comment on some of those videos. And he said, you know, the most fascinating thing about these videos is neither one of you really know what you're talking about. But what happens is the conversation leaves this space in between that makes me think about so many things. And so it left his mind free to roam through this kind of edge space. I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about the importance of edges in, in painting, but the edges are where you leave room for the viewer to use their imaginations um, to try to come up with their own story. If, if the edges aren't meeting, if the edges aren't sharp, then there's something left kind of unfinished there. And that's kind of what you're doing with your documentary too. You're leaving little, you're leaving little tidbits. You you bring in a little two second clip and then a five second clip, and there's little. Well, what's the connection to those two? And that leaves room for the viewer to kind of respond inside their own imagination to, 
to make the connections, right? So, um, and then the other thing you said was they were they were locked into that box, that that rigid ideological political box in their conversations. And one of the things that I like to talk about on my channel is the problem that has happened with science in the last many, many years is that science has kind of gotten locked into a box. And us, you know, in many ways, each of the specialists have their own little silo and they don't always see what the other specialists are working on. And so there's a lot of questions that they're not asking. Or maybe there's questions that they're not allowed to ask because of the academic environment or the people who are providing the grant money and uh, kind of open that up a little bit and let people take a look at it, you know? Oh, yeah, that that's so true. This is, I've noticed, because I, you know, as I said before, I was, I was somewhat addicted to higher education uh, for, for a period of my life. And um, I wound up getting my master's in philosophy down at Long Beach State here. And I did, did it on the side while I was working. Um, and I noticed a curious phenomenon. And it was that every one of those professors was a specialist in a certain area of philosophy, philosophy, religion, epistemology, metaphysics, modal logic, whatever it was, right? But they didn't, and they would always say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in that other area. You got to talk to somebody else about that, right? Everybody was an expert on one little thing, because that's what you do for your dissertation. You have to know more than everybody about that one little subject so you can be an expert, right? But then the weird thing is, is that in all of that expertise, I would say maybe wisdom is lost, Wisdom in the sense of well, what do you do? Just practical, you know, how do you live your life, right? So mm -hmm. I noticed that the I had a lot of undergraduates in my graduate classes, you know, because it was so we would have a, a little extra assignments as graduates, and there would also be undergraduates in the class. So these were by this time I was probably tw late twenties, um, so I was a bit more mature, and then they, these were all you know 18, 19, 20 year olds, and they we're having to put together all of this niche expertise into a, a system for them to be able to live their life, you might say. And it was totally incoherent, the way that they would take something from this professor, who, which is like needed to have all of these caveats attached to it and everything like that. And then one from this professor from a totally different tradition, totally mm -hmm. different school of philosophy, try to put that those together and they're incompatible. They're, uh, as Thomas Kuhn says, they're incommensurate sort of things, right? Uh -huh. And and it's like, I just was looking at them going, good heavens, like you are so confused. And I became kind of a little voice of wisdom to them because I was like, could understand a little bit more of what each professor was saying. And so I'd be able to kind of put a little bit of it together. And mm -hmm. um, But if you think of that as a culture-wide problem, of all of these experts on one little tiny thing, but nobody willing to talk about anything else besides that one thing that they're an expert on for fear of not being qualified or something like that, you know? Um, so you, you like the, the, you know, the CS Lewis types that would write about anything, you know, or put weigh in on anything, you know, or, or, um, you know, the public intellectual types, you know, the people that you'd say, well, you know what, whatever that person thinks about it, how they process through a problem is something that I trust. And so if I'm confused, I'm going to go to that person, like that kind of a sense of a, of a wise a wisdom figure or a mentorish figure um, is increasingly rare today, I think, because of that weird phenomenon in higher education, maybe I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the symptomology of it is. Well, I think one of the things that it occurs to me is that we've lost the sense of the importance of context. So these kids are picking one little thing from this one professor because that fits someplace in their brain and then they pick something else from another professor, but, but they have no sense of how any of those ideas would work in all the various contexts of life because life is very, very filled with context. 
you know, how you relate with your friend is going to be different than how you relate with your professor is going to be different than how you relate with your loved ones. And um, if you're a parent, how you relate with your children. And so you, if you, if you get this little crystalline piece of truth from some expert and you carry that around with you as though you're going to look at everything through that lens, it might work in your romantic relationship, but it's not going to work as a parent with your child, you know? There, there's, there has to be a deeper layer underneath all of that that connects all the silos, right? All the silos. If all of those guys have a piece of truth, there's some deeper truth connecting all those pieces of truth. And that's the part where they all say, well, you know, I don't know about that because I'm an, only an expert in this. You know? um, it's the same way like the medical experts, you know, they might be expert in their own little realm, but maybe they don't understand a single thing about, you know, the human body is so complicated that um, I remember one time my dad had, was having some kind of problem with skin rashes and he went to 15 different doctors and they keep giving him all these different kinds of cream to put on his skin and everything. Finally, he went to one doctor and that doctor just said, <clears throat> have you used any public showers lately? My dad would say, yeah, I go to the swim league every, every week and, you know, work out in the pool. And then I use public shower. He said, well, you've picked up an internal something that's causing all this external thing. But that guy was a real diagnostician because he understood the whole body. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, I have a perfect example. <laughs> um, so, so as you know, I've been, I, I've got this super, super side project that I've been working on for years about urban planning. Mm -hmm. and the built environment right and so i remember interviewing somebody that was talking about uh traffic engineers you know and so you have a traffic engineer and the traffic engineer's goal is to uh have the most efficient let's say movement of traffic from point a to point b right and so the irony of the traffic engineer decide designing let's say a a, a city or town is that the traffic is designed to move people past these little businesses as quickly as possible. And so the little businesses die because that's the goal. Well, the goal is to move the traffic as most efficiently as possible, except when you don't want to do that, <laughs> except for when you want to slow the traffic down so that you can have people notice the, the little businesses, let's say, you know, so they came up with this idea of traffic calming, you know, and traffic calming is a concept that they uh, came up with during the new urbanist um, uh, period, new urbanist phase, which was late 80s up and through the 2000s of trying to fix some of these problems. And they said, well, if we put trees and we put parking spaces and we put these, maybe a windy road, you know, something that forces you to slow down, then that's actually going to economically cause that neighborhood or that group of businesses to thrive because now you're going to be going slow enough to, to notice them. So, Yes, the, it's it's the you have to have somebody that's thinking holistically about the, let's say the town, it, because if it's just a traffic engineer, as good as in fact the better that traffic engineer is, if they're still operating under the wrong um, assumption for that little piece, you know, this isn't the area where we want that efficiency of traffic. You know, this is where we have a different, a higher goal, or a different goal, or a more holistic goal so we're going to change and we're not going to do the most efficient thing we're going to do something else that i think is is a perfect picture of the, the modern condition of experts that are super expert super good at doing what they do but it might not be the right thing for that situation yeah that's a great example but you know there's such a problem with that example too because you have now you have them designing a certain way for things to slow down in a particular neighborhood of little businesses. But there might be another neighborhood of little businesses that still has the people whizzing by because of the traffic engineers work. And now the government has gotten in bed with that particular group of businesses and they're gonna thrive and these other guys over here are gonna go out of business. I mean, mm. we, we live near a small town and in our small town, they did this big remodel of the small town a few years ago, which if they had done it properly, they would have made a space, they would have made the sidewalks wider so that restaurants could spill out onto the sidewalk with their little tables and, and tents and so forth. 
you know, umbrellas and so forth. <clears throat> but they didn't do that. What they did was they widened every corner. So every corner is very wide so that they could have put a big pot of flowers out there. And, um, and then the rest of the street was regular with the parking on it. Well, it so happened that there were a few businesses on those corners that got to take advantage of the corners and put a few tables out there. Like there was a Starbucks on one corner and a, some other restaurant on another corner. But all the other restaurants, they couldn't put stuff out on the sidewalk. And so it really causes a disjunct in the way people are able to do business. I mean, it, it causes a big financial advantage to the business that's sitting right next to that open space. Well, then COVID comes along and they had to pretty much shut down the whole street so that every restaurant could put their tents out on the sidewalk. So now they've left it that way so that we finally have a downtown where there's some life. And some of these businesses have come back to life, but it took a disaster for that to yeah. happen, right? Yeah. It's yeah, the just world so is very complicated. <laughs> oh, very complicated. Yeah. And, and trying to meddle with a complex system, no matter how smart you are, yeah. is, you know, oftentimes just producing unintended results. I think that the most charming experience I've had in a town was when I was in old Corfu town over the summer working on a movie in Greece. And this, this old Venetian fort, you know, with all of its little narrow alleyways and everything was still functioning better in terms of just if you want to talk about the health and life of a street mm -hmm. than anything built in the last hundred years. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was just this, I lived on a, an alleyway that was absolutely beautiful with little flowers growing out of the rocks of the ancient walls and, you know, little restaurants and all the restaurant owners knew each other and they all lived upstairs from their restaurant. They just come down in the morning and start cooking croissants and I just thought, wait, this is this is like the most amazing thing I've ever seen, you know. And this must be what life is was like before the Industrial Revolution, or something. Like that. You know, I mean, they had obviously harder things to worry about than we do, you know. So I wouldn't want to go back there. But you know, I was just I, the self organizing way that a neighborhood as organism it unfolds itself if you let it is amazing to me. Yeah, I still have video of the night that we went to this little plaza in Venice that was off the beaten path. There weren't any, very few tourists over there because it was a long, long walk away from all the other touristy areas. And we had found a little restaurant in that plaza that we wanted to have dinner at. So we made reservations and then we went back there later. It was just a little hole in the wall with like four tables outside and four tables inside. And we're sitting out on the plaza and there was only one other little restaurant on that plaza. And we were there until dark. And just as it got dark, this 16 piece brass band appeared from the apartments and they all came out and started playing music. And then everybody started pouring out the apartments and dancing on the plaza. <laughs> it was so magical. It's like, why can't life be like this? We, we can't have nice things here in this country because. Well, you can have a place places to park. You can have really easy time parking. That's what we have. Nice parking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can park your car, but you're not going to find a brass band there. But you'll yeah. you'll have plenty of place to park your car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess. So you said you had some questions for me. <clears throat> yeah. So so what I'm interested in is, um, uh, and let me know if we're going too long here. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but um uh, in the time that we have left, maybe, um, if you, I, I would like to hear, um, sort of what, how you feel right now about your little journey with your channel, you know, from starting your channel, you already mentioned your first guest, um, and you know, the decision to keep going, um, and how you've changed along the way, you know, what's, um, you know, what, what, what do you, what would you say to the Karen before the channel started versus now, you know, um, how, how does, you know, I'm, I'm looking for sort of like, what's, yeah. How's it feel for you after having gone on this journey for a little while? Well, this, I mean, this probably sounds very pedantic, but it's been extremely satisfying 
because when I first started out, I had this question. I was trying to understand why Jordan Peterson's maps of meaning made so much sense to me from the perspective of the process of art making that I do. Now, I don't do the same process of art making that everybody does. I do something quite different. But the process that I use is a process that I learned in a class on creativity. <clears throat> and all those principles of creativity and the principles of how you um, enhance or focus or drive your creativity, those principles I had determined probably 20 years ago that I was, saw those principles working out in, in the universe and in pretty much every domain of knowledge that I looked into. But when I heard Jordan Peterson start saying some of the same things that I had been thinking of, but saying them in his language in Maps of Meaning and in his lectures, I thought there's something very peculiar here, but I didn't know enough to um, know if I was on the right track. And so I started the channel so that I could talk to people who knew more than I did about a variety of subjects to see if this idea played out in science and in philosophy and in physics and in chemistry and biology and all that kind of thing. And, uh, and I have pursued that singular question through the four plus years that I've been doing this. And I just keep learning more and more that makes me think more and more. I was onto something back then. And, uh, and part of the thing that's really fun about this is that there are people that contact me that don't want to be on the show that just want to talk offline. Some of them want to talk about their struggles with the meaning crisis, or some of them want to talk about maybe, <clears throat> um, maybe relationship issues, or some of them want to talk about scientific principles, but they don't want to talk online because reasons. <laughs> And so I have all these offline conversations as well that are extremely enriching. And, uh, but, the, but the big takeaway for me was in order to participate in these conversations, I had to get an education about all these different topics in order to even know what questions to ask. So I've had to dive deep into lots of things that I never would have known anything about before. I've had to read lots of books that would never have occurred to me to read. I've had the opportunity to meet fascinating people. So it's been a wild ride. Um, but once in a while, I step outside my lane and do some episodes that aren't really focused on the same question. And those are fun. But after a little while, I start feeling like, you know, this isn't really who I'm supposed to be. And so I kind of get back in the lane again. So then a couple of years ago, I started thinking that there were some scientists that I really wanted to talk to, but I also thought to myself, they're busy. They have their science labs. They have books that they're working on. They have people that they're responsible to. First of all, why would they want to come on a channel this small and talk to somebody who's not a scientist who doesn't really know anything? And second of all, even if they were willing to come on, I would feel like I was not offering them an adequate audience for their time. And so I didn't want to bother them, but I still wanted to talk to them. So I gave it some thought. I prayed. And what came to my mind was I could offer them an extra, like an added value by introducing them to somebody that I thought they should talk to. And uh, for example, I put Michael Levin, who is a, a developmental synthetic biologist, I guess you would call it, working on limb regeneration. I put him together with John Verveke, who is a cognitive scientist, because I knew they would have things to talk about, and I knew they'd never find each other otherwise. <laughs> and so they had this great conversation, and it was a plus for both of them. I knew it was a plus because they wanted to do it again. And so I put together different people like that. I uh, I put John Verveke together with Wolfgang Smith, who's a philosopher, and, and they had a terrific conversation. And uh, Jonathan Peugeot and Wolfgang Smith had a terrific conversation. And those have all been a, a lot of fun to do. I had to really dig deep into my reserves and study a lot of stuff in order to be prepared for those conversations. 
But at the end of the day, I think those are great and they get a lot of views. But in, in a certain way, they don't help me towards my goal because my goal is to be able to really wrestle with this big idea that I'm working on. And once in a while, I will find a rando who is also interested in this same boatload of information. And then the two of us can really engage and share information with each other and dig deep and try to figure out what's going on here. And so those are really, really satisfying conversations because I feel like I get a little further along the road to finding answers. And so this morning I, I opened up, was it Twitter or was it someplace else? Somebody posted uh, a, a new book that just been published by Elisa Warrero. Might have been Michael Levin that put this up. I just have to show this because it just kind of blew my mind. Um, I think this is it. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so um, let's just look at this paragraph right here. This is Alicia Warrero grounding her work in the problem of causation. Warrero challenges previously held beliefs that only forceful impacts are causes. Constraints, she claims, bring about effects as well, and they enable the emergence of coherence. In context changes everything, Morero shows that coherence is induced by enabling constraints. And the resulting coherence is then maintained by constitutive constraints. Now, this is something I've been talking about since the beginning for four years, four and a half years on this channel, is constraints and context are so important. And I know they show up everywhere. <laughs> And I knew I didn't have enough science to be able to make the claims that she's making, but I knew it just from art, just from the way that art making happens and the importance of constraints in developing creativity or in kind of pushing creativity out of a person. And, uh, and so I knew that I was going to find the importance of constraints when I dug into and I've talked to um, guys that do coding. I've talked to uh, mathematicians. I've talked to chemists and biologists. And, and in, everywhere you look, these boundaries and constraints and edge conditions are so important. And so it's, I mean, it's very exciting to have an idea and then see it show up everywhere and then see other people coming up with the idea years later and, you know, sort of validate. <laughs> validate my research you know so that's okay, been a lot so, of fun oh, hmm? it's, can, can you clarify what so coherent so constraint and coherency i think i know what those mean but could you maybe just clarify a little bit what what how those two things fit together well so for example um <clears throat> in in the artistic process that i do I shouldn't say do because I haven't painted since I started the channel very much <laughs> too busy with this stuff, but in the, in the um, artistic process that I was doing, I would always start out first with a very firm constraint of I'm going to do a lot of paintings and they're all going to be of this same subject. <clears throat> so I can't get outside my lane. I have a very tight box here. I'm going to stay inside this box. So the easiest example to talk about is the cello series that's at the beginning of every episode. You see all these different cellists. They're all sitting pretty much the same same way, sitting in the same place in the rectangle, but every one of them is different. Now, when I first started painting, all I ever thought about was reproducing a photograph. But when I got into this whole um, class on creativity on, on the idea that constraints can actually produce creativity, then um, the reason it works in art is that after painting the same thing three or four times, you get kind of bored with just changing the colors. You know, maybe I'll have a cellist wearing a red dress and then maybe I'll have a cellist wearing a blue dress, <laughs> but it's always just like the photograph, you know, 
how many times can I paint this same cellist? But what if, what if I did the whole thing with an underground texture that would change the way the paint moved on the canvas? Or what if I did the whole thing with, uh, did it all in blues? So even her skin was blue. Or what if I did it with paint dripping down the canvas to represent the rhythm of the music? Or what if, you know, so this what if question kind of informs all the different possibilities that are there. So I start out with the trajectory of doing 20 paintings, but by the time I finished 20 paintings, I could do another hundred paintings of a cello and I would never run out of ideas. Now, where did all that stuff come from? I never was a creative person before, but it was these imposed constraints. Well, the same thing works if you have a cell, you can look at a cell, a living cell, and if they nick the edge of the cell so that the boundary opens up, everything pours out, it fades away, there's no more cell anymore. <laughs> it's that constraint around the outside of the cell that keeps everything organized and working inside of there. So, so yes, it it's not just the constraint because with art, obviously I'm working on constraint. I've chosen a mood before I start. I've chosen a palette. I'm thinking all the time about the intersections of um, how you create unity and variety, unity and multiplicity as Jonathan would say, how you create um, variations in the gradation of color, variations in the width of the line, variations in the softness and hardness of the edges, all of these things that you're considering all the time that you're working so that in the end, you have a harmonious whole that is coherent as a piece, but you can also take any little, you could cut a square out of any piece of the canvas and set it aside with a bunch of other squares cut out of other canvases. And you'd know immediately which painting that that square went with, because it's, even though there's a lot of variety on the canvas, every piece of it is coherent with the whole. And, and to me, that just lines up with scripture where it says he holds all things together or in another translation it is in him, all things consist and he is the great artist. So of course the universe acts like a work of art. It acts like a work of art in the way the original idea came about in the way that the, the universe develops over time. It, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> this totally really, okay. So uh, it has to do also, I think with identity. Yes. Oh, know? absolutely. Yeah. So because, um, you know, if you try to be everything all at once, like the movie, everything everywhere, all at once, mm -hmm. you're going to be nobody. Right. That's what that movie was about. I think, you know, she, she, or the multiverse in that movie. I don't know if you saw that movie. Everything, I haven't seen it now. Is it worth um, it? Yeah, I think it's worth seeing. Um, it won all the awards this year. And it was interesting because different students of mine and different professors at the school I taught at, I teach at, had different opinions on it, you know, but I watched it after I actually, I heard all their opinions first because I was late watching it. And then finally I did watch it. And I thought, oh my gosh, this it's, it's all about the multiverse. It starts out and she, first of all, she goes to her tax lady and her tax lady says, hold on this here. It says here, you're a novelist and you're a teacher and you're a dentist and you're this and you're that you're lying. You can't be all those things. You know, you can't write off all this stuff because you're only one person. You can, you're not all these things. And then that's the that's the literal reality. And then in the movie, she gets sucked into the multiverse and she meets all these other versions of the world where she's all these different identities in these in this multiverse, you know. And I thought that is a perfect example of what we the reality that we live in today, where you have an endless, you know, plethora of life choices that you could choose. Mm -hmm. and, and and the whole thing is like as soon as I choose one, I'm killing off all the other ones. So I can never choose one, you know. So that means I gotta be everywhere all at once. You know, I got to be everyone all at once. I got to be everything all at once, you know? And what I'm learning is um, in advising students, for example, um, you kind of have to tell them, look, you're going to have to choose one life to live. You know, you're going to have to have an identity, you know, 
you're going to be the person that does X, you know? And, and if you choose that and you constrain yourself to that, mm-hmm. you're going to find that you have a more rich uh, life, you, you might say, you know, if you're like one minute, you're a jazz musician, and then the next minute you're an actor, and then the next minute you're, you know, uh, whatever, you know, like you're never going to go very deep in any of those one things, you know, like you're saying with the painting, you're never going to go to the point where this subject is really thoroughly explored because you've moved on to the next identity you've, Mm -hmm. you know, so maybe coherency of coherency of, you know, personhood, like, you know, um, anybody who we know that's famous artist like Van Gogh or Andy Warhol or whatever, and you can pick it out. Okay. That's them, right. Mm -hmm. It's because they, they constrain themselves to, this is the kind of work that I do, you know? So it's not just a, an expression of your personality. Like, well, like, you know, automatically my work is going to look like this. They probably also in some sense consciously constricted themselves to, I'm going to, exp- this is the question that I'm interested in exploring. And they limit themselves to that in order to explore it more deeply. Yeah, well, I mean, you certainly see that with someone like Picasso, because when he first started out, he was very representational in his work. And then when he went through the blue period, he was still sort of what you would call semi-representational, even though there was a lot of mood, like, you know, the blue man, <clears throat> everything is in blue. And and uh, there's a little bit of distortion in the figures, but it's still a recognizable figure. But then when he went into his whatever you call that period is more like semi-abstract period, not completely up. Ab- well, I guess it was abstract, but it's not completely uh, non-objective because you could still tell the dudes descending the staircase. You could still tell that they're somewhere in there. There are some people. <laughs> um, so it, within each one of his periods, he had a coherent style. And you could pick that out. And so because we have we know his history, we can go back and look at those periods of his style and say, yes, that's him. And uh, but but there's a downside to that, too, because the further he got into the abstract period, the more it was sort of a cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching for him, you know, turn out another one of these and for the gallery. And so he'd turn out another one of those. And it was no longer I don't think it was any longer a real exploration of what he might have done but he sort of got locked into a certain thing that he was very good at. And I do think that happens to some artists. Um, Thomas Kincaid is a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very recognizably his, but I, we would go into some of his galleries once in a while and we'd go visit Carmel or something. And once in a while, there'd be a beautiful landscape in there, which was also him but it wasn't the same style as the Thomas Kincaid painting. So it didn't sell like those, but that other thing was much more what I would have called art. And uh, so I think, I mean, I've, I've always struggled with that. I could never get into a gallery because I don't have a look, you know, in a gallery, they always say, well, we want to be able to sell one and then be able to say, we've got another Karen Wong in the back room. We can pull out and put up here and people will know that's a Karen Wong, but. You know, when you look at my work, I don't, I don't have a look. Everything is different. Everything everywhere all at once. But hopefully within each frame, it's coherent. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now, this, this piece that's behind me right now that I just set out, I, because I've been looking at it for a long time, and I thought maybe it'll look different if I look at it through the screen. It has some problems that I haven't been able to figure out, and it doesn't have that coherent look. So, um and I have a piece hanging on the wall in my gallery that does not have that coherent look. And the only way to get it coherent again is to repaint some aspects of the whole thing to draw it back together again. And it just seems like too much work at this point. But hmm. but anyway, the whole thing about, about um, constraint and coherence, when you were talking about that, I remembered a message I heard the other day that was just so good. Um, you were talking about if you're, if you're everything everywhere all at once, then you can never be anybody. 
<laughs> you have no identity, right? And this whole message was just about the words no and yes. And he had gone through and looked at the times that um, that no is used or that things are represented in the negative and when the yes is used. <clears throat> Particularly looking at that passage, um, let your no be no and your yes be yes. And you don't have to go beyond that. And when he tied the whole thing together, he was saying, you know, what can happen oftentimes is that you allow your yes to become diluted because you say yes to too many things. And if you're saying yes to things that you shouldn't be saying yes to, that dilutes your yes to God. And your yes to God no longer has the same emphasis or power that it had when you only say yes to God. And when you say no to the things of this world, that strengthens your yes to God. And when you, um, one of the examples he used that I think ties into this identity idea is, you know how it is, you're having a big party and you've invited a whole lot of people to your barbecue or whatever. And then some people will say, oh, I'd love to come, but I've got three other things that day, but I'll just pop in and say, hi, is that okay? And he said, if you say yes to that, what you're basically doing is saying, yes, I agree that we're not important. <laughs> and uh, and you can go ahead and dilute your world that way if you want to. But <clears throat> when you say yes to that, you're, you're, you're diluting the whole relationship. And we certainly don't want the, to be the people who say to God, well, Yes, I'll I'll be there. I have a lot of other things going on on Sunday, but I'll pop in for a few minutes, you know. Well, is he supposed to say, "Oh, thank you very much for putting yourself out on my behalf," you know? It so this whole idea, I thought I thought it was just I I'm not representing the message very well, but to me the, what really stuck with me is that it's very important for me to say no to the things that are not um not God's best for me, because when I say yes to those things, it makes it harder for me to say yes to God when I'm called upon to do so. So if I make my life too inclusive and allow everything in, then I'm nobody. I don't have an identity. I no longer have my identity in Christ. And when he said that, he wasn't talking about our modern problem with identity in the world today but i could see crystal clear that that's what's going on you know jonathan's always talking about if you bring the entire margin in then you don't have a structure anymore because there's no margin right yeah I, I think in story structure for example um you'll notice that characters will go through a refining period and that's where all of the uh you know, seeds that are that don't that are not the proper ones for them are going to get pruned away. You know, um, you know, Jonathan talks about this in terms of um, things get whittled down and whittled down until finally you only have one path forward, and that's who you are. That's your identity. You know, um, for him, his story was that he finally the only thing that he had left to do was become an icon carver you know, and then, and that's, that's what sort of flourished and flowered for him, you know, and I notice it, for example, with filmmakers like Martin Scorsese, you know, he's got a burning question, just like you have a burning question about a big question about your channel, why you started your channel. He has one about the human condition. And it has to do with human depravity. And every single movie of his is an exploration of that. But when he steps out of his lane, as you said, and does it someone that's not really concerned with that actual question that he has, it's not as good because he it's that burning question isn't behind it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think that there's something that there's something about that. There's something about the idea of, you know, pruning away the, the, the branches that are going off in all these different directions, not because those branches are bad for in general, but they're not you, you know, they're that that's not the, 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 the pathway that's going to produce fruit, let's say for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to sort of find, okay, you know, this is the path that, um, that, that is going to yield fruit for me. And this, so therefore I'm not going to go 
down these other paths, even though those are, they might be, I mean, someone might say, why aren't you volunteering for this cause? You know, mm -hmm. what do you think that cause is bad? <laughs> You're like, well, no, <laughs> but I'm, I'm choosing. Right. You know, when I can't did you do stop anything. beating your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, this is what I advise my, you know, anybody that's a younger person that wants to know, you know, they, they, there's a real sense of wanting to make the world a better place, you know, and what they wind up doing is just arguing with other people about how to make the world a better place or accusing other people of not this or not that or voting a certain way or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but what I always say is, look, find something that, you know, will make the world a better place and do it. <laughs> you know, like that's a, it sounds kind of simple, but like find something that you know will work, meaning that like you can tell whether or not it's working. For example, arguing with someone on Twitter, how are you supposed to know if that works? You're arguing with a stranger online. Even if you convince them, are they even a real person? You know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, so, so I always say, look, find something that you can measure whether or not it worked. And then do that and then measure and see if it is working. And if it is working, keep doing it, you know, find something also that you are passionate about in terms of like a burning question or, you know, just something that is really um, interesting to you because what you're interested in says a lot about you. And that it probably will mean that you'll keep doing it because you're interested in it. You know, like, for example, Paul Vanderclay, I think there's no possible way he could not be making those videos he would be talking to himself in his office if he wasn't, <laughs> you know, like he, he, he has to make those videos, you know, it's not work for him to make those videos, you know, and that's how I feel. That's what I tell people. I say, find something that you don't see as work that, you know, will make the world a better place. And maybe that's the, and prune off everything else and just go for that. You know, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's how I approach it. Well, you might still have to, for a time, work at something else in order to put bread on the table, <clears throat> but but you have to keep doing the thing that it, it, Peterson always talks about that little thing that glimmers out in front of you that's drawing you forward because, <clears throat> well, there has to be two parts to that, though. It can't just be that little thing out in front that glimmers that draws you forward. First, you have to have your gaze fixed on that, which is above the horizon at the highest possible good. Because that means that when you move towards that which is out in front of you, then the important things that you need to get there are going to come into your field of vision and help you with it. This is why, let's say, <clears throat> maybe this is a bad example because I don't know anything about Scorsese's work. But if he's working on one of his burning question movies, then what he needs to make that story come into line and to be coherent becomes obvious to him becomes evident to him but if he's working on something that isn't one of his burning questions probably things are just sort of hither hither and yonder and he can't quite pull it all together to get there and I, and I think that's the difference you know I've done a lot of things in my life many many I've had the opportunity to fall into many interesting careers but um, but when I am not moving towards my whatever that thing is out in front of me it's not good i mean those those careers that i stumbled into ended up being dead ends that were very incoherent so yeah mm -hmm. you can kind of tell when something is working for you and when it's a, when you have that feeling i guess peterson talked about it once when he was saying when you're using language if it's your own language and you're not just parroting someone else <clears throat> You have a feeling of strength or centeredness or something about it. Yeah. You can feel the coherence of who you are. And I yeah, think. Well, yeah. The coherence of who you are. That's what they, the old school name for that is integrity. You know, yeah. Like yeah. You, you, you are who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and integrity just means you're integrated, right? Right. So sort of fitting together because mm -hmm. you're, well, I mean, one of the things I've struggled to articulate on this channel that seems so obvious inside my head is the way all of us have all of our life experiences that have built who we are, but not only our life experiences, also everything that we've read and 
all the conversations I've had with people and all the arguments I've had and all the songs I've heard and and every song that I've heard, every time I hear it, it's something new to me because of things that have happened in between the last time I heard that song. And so you, this whole thing builds up inside of us as though it's a, as though we started out with some sort of uh, a matrix or a framework inside that had little feelers on it that's gathering stuff. And we're gathering all that and it's it's filling this matrix in more and more until it's taking on flesh like a building or like a city or something inside of us and <clears throat> so then every time i talk everything i'm thinking about goes out through that filter into the world and when people hear it it goes through their filter into them and then when they talk it comes back out of their filter so all of us are um in the in the language of star star trek all of us are adding our distinctiveness to the collective basically <clears throat> because we each have such a unique perspective that that makes each person who is fully integrated a necessary part of the whole that's why creativity is so important for everyone to participate in they don't all have to be painting pictures but making documentaries or writing books or writing poetry or becoming a really good chef or whatever it is that gets your creative impulse out there into the world, then all of our creativity can talk to each other because sometimes our words fail in communicating this deeper thing that's under there, but our creativity can always help other people as we are. I think it was Mary who used to say we're all we're all building a better world together. I hope you get Mary in the documentary. That's a beautiful story. And uh yeah, I'd like to. I definitely would like to. Yeah. Yeah, at least at least her tagline at the end of every video is so beautiful. I can't I can't remember it exactly, but it's something about and together we're building a world, you know. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. This has been great, Justin. Um, we are a little bit over time, but but it's yeah. been great. I always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I want to hear more about your your narrative, your set of narrative videos. Um, so maybe we can do that again sometime in the future. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I sort of dove into this little documentary project uh, head first because I know that right now, because of, of the writers' strike. The, the work is slow out there. So mm -hmm. I, I said, okay, I can be productive on this right now. So that's my number one um, project right now. And I'm going to sort of push through as much as I can. And, uh, and then eventually I'll get back to the, the seven basic plots stuff. Yeah. So there's always well, something. You know, the last time there was a big writer strike. Well, maybe it's not the last time, but the last time I remember a big writer strike, what came out of that was a whole slew of reality television. Maybe this oh. time, what will come out of the writer's strike is a whole slew of new documentaries. Oh, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe um, there'll be space for your feature length documentary in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't know. My my thing is just put one foot ahead of the other. Just keep working on it. And then hopefully mm -hmm. where it, it winds up out there um, is uh, is not totally up to me. So if people like it and if i can keep going then i'll just keep going and then see what happens super exciting thank you for joining me today justin okay thanks karen yeah, have a great day bye-bye okay bye